We're going to get panel one started. Um, my name is Alexandra Stern. I'm a historian who has written on the history of eugenics and um, the history of eugenics intersecting with race, sexuality, people with disabilities, and also I've written on the history of medical genetics and issues of social justice. And I'm really delighted to be here today, um, and I'm honored to be here and to be moderating this panel, where I'll also be speaking. Um, the, this panel is the what panel. So eugenics and disability, past and present. So we'll be delving into what is it and what is this tangled relationship that we all want to understand better. Um, first, I'm going to read bios of the four presenters. Um, and then we're going to um, see a video uh, with starring Glenn, who I'll be introducing in a second. And then um, after that, we will break up into table discussions and then come back for a bigger group discussion. Um, so first we will see Glenn's video. Glenn Sinclair is a member of the Living Archives of Eugenics in Western Canada team. You heard a little bit about that group from Kathy. And himself a survivor of the Sexual Sterilization Act that was in place in Alberta, Canada from 1928 to 1972. During his time at the provincial training school, Glenn would say he was quiet and desperate. He was a quiet and desperate person with no hope. He felt displaced and as though he had no purpose in life, like he wasn't a real person. Glenn had to escape from the people who ran the PTS. He was placed on work placement on a farm, but learned that they intended to take him back to the center because the farmer was not sat satisfied with his work. So he packed a duffel bag and he ran. Glenn ran, crossing fields, relying on the kindness of strangers, staying in shelters until he could land on his feet. Since then, Glenn has found hope, worked, traveled, and successfully participated in a class action lawsuit against the government of Alberta that resulted in financial compensation for victims of sterilization. Um, after seeing his video, I'll speak, uh, as I, I already introduced myself, um, so you'll hear more from me in a minute. I'll just say this is my alma mater. I did my BA here in my own major. I made up Central American Studies, all about social justice in the 1980s, so I'm very happy to be back. Um, next, um, our next speaker will be Marcy Darbnowski. She's the co-founder of the Center for Genetics and Society, and she served as its executive director since January of this year. She speaks and writes widely on social justice, human rights, health equity, and public interest Im and the public interest implications of human genetic and assisted reproductive technologies. And lastly, but certainly not least, we will hear from Nicola Fairbrother. And she is the director of Edmonton's Neighborhood Bridges, which is a human rights organization committed to ending oppression for people with intellectual disabilities. So we'll move on with the video. Glenn George Sinclair is my full name. I live down by the Mutar Conservatory in a condo right now. Glenn George Sinclair, sterilization survivor, is now in his 60s balding with glasses and flips through the pages of a file. Well, whatever, you know, you know, whatever you see here about the sterilization issue, anything about what, what it says here. Typewritten documents appear. You know, what, about what, ha what happened back then yeah. is all here. I was putting uh, the Sisters of Atonement home to begin with. One of them is marked confidential. And from there, when I reached the age of seven, I was uh, sent to the uh, PDS, mm -hmm. the Provincial Training School. I felt kind of like um, I was just going to be there and live like a, live my life with something like a, a zombie, like you know, lock them up, throw the key away. A photo of the Michener Center PTS shows a tiny square building surrounded by fences. You're commanded to do things. They yell at you, do this, do that. And you can't do this, or you can't do that. You felt like you were being ordered around like a dog, like an animal, in a cage sort of thing, you know? And you didn't feel... Glenn shrugs. Human at all. You just feel as if, you're, as if you exist. A sign on the grass reads Michener Center. Like you feel nothing. Like there's no hope. Did you know you were sterilized? I thought at the time 
Of course we all did, and we didn't ask questions. One of the documents has headlined Direction of the Eugenics Board for the Province of Alberta. That we were having your appendix out, you know, so I didn't really, you know, being that age, you, you never ask these questions or anything because the staff would, would tell you it's none of your business sort of thing, you know, and wouldn't tell you what, what for, why, why you have this operation. I was marched up to the um, main building, and they had a board there, something like this, a table there, and a few people there asking questions about me, and, and to me, of course, just to see what kind of a person I am and what I say. And um, I think it was about five minutes discussion. At the bottom, the board directs that Glenn Sinclair be given a vasectomy. And then they sent me home. I looked into the matter a little bit, you know, and uh, found out, yes, I, I was sterilized. But it really, I didn't do it at the time. I didn't do anything about it. I really didn't do anything about it. Didn't said anything because made any issue about it at the time. Would you like to have had children? I would, yes. I would. Glenn nods at a dark-haired woman sitting across the table from him. I would like to just live, live a normal life like anybody else, you know. But now it's been taken away from me, so... He shrugs sadly, then points at photos in an album. And this is uh, pictures of the uh, Michener Center. And, um, of course, this, the main building, this is where they took you and asked you all these questions. Mm -hmm. Those five minute sessions they had there before you got sterilized. One shows firefighters dousing it with water as it burns. Of course, it burnt down. It was struck by lightning. It was a godsend. Another shows the word clinic on the front. Oh, pretty good when that happened. Yeah, this is where they sent us to get sterilized. Yet another is also surrounded by fences. And this is the school where we got our training. And I went to. Uh, See, I went far as level, what they, they call them level, not grades, but we took different grades. Mm -hmm. And I went to level eight, as far as I've gotten in school. And actually, actually that was about grade seven. That's when I got what I got, but no further. <laughs> that was my education. This is what some of the buildings look like. Obviously, you can see a fence right behind. Mm -hmm. That's quite high, you know. Yeah. Just in case you want, you try and want to escape, you can't because of the fence. A photo shows five boys standing by the fence with their faces blurred out. They're very strict about that. Yeah. What would happen to somebody if they ran away and got caught? They would put put you in a place what they call the quiet room, and you'd be there for about a month. They'd keep you there for about a month, and sometimes in other circumstances you would get what they call a strap and get your bottom and back black and blue with the strap, I think about 20 lashes with the strap. So that's why I'm, I was kind of scared never to step out of line. <laughs> I, was being, I had to be very careful and watch my, my P's and Q's. So this is where he went to uh, where we had, went camping again. We'd stay about a week. Out at uh, Gall Lake. A photo shows the young Glenn posing by a sign that reads the Dr. Randall R. McLean Cottage. Yeah, that's what back in my day, this is what it looked like. Several cabins appear nestled among the trees. We slept in bunk beds, swimming, swimming, and went for walks, and stuff like that. These are the things they had us do. And we had a little more freedom, more or less, was what I say. Uh, this is a picture of me back in my farm days. I was staying at a place called Willowville at the time. Glenn, as a young man, stands beside a cow. Yeah, there was a little more freedom there. But, of course, you had to go and do your chores and everything, and what you're assigned to do, you had to go and do. Another photo shows him milking a cow. Now, I guess that's the only picture you're going to see of me uh, milking a cow. We learn, we learn th things like milking cow, animal husbandry, and looking after different things, wildlife and stuff. They had what they call farm classes back then, and they taught you all these different things about different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of granaries, and it was quite educational. But it was not for me. 
This was me when I was about, uh, let's see, I was 10 years old in this picture. And this one here, I'd be about, I think I was around about 18 or 17 years of age in this picture. Who, who are they to play, uh, play God and kind of judge us for what we are? You know, we all, we're all humans on this earth and we, we all have our place, you know, and what we say and what we do, you know, we have our freedoms. So, being an institution, you're just, you're nothing, you feel totally lost. Glenn and another man in the 60s watch video on a laptop computer as end credits appear. Something like this. A table there and a few people there asking questions about me. Well, you'd think you'd have your appendix out and whatever. But you never asked what, what for, what, what the operation was really for. You know, because it was none of, they figured it was none of your business to ask the staff. <laughs> yeah. Ask you, what, you know, mind your own business. I had to, I we were all too young even to ask questions. Yeah, <laughs> and had, shut, had to shut up, you know, and just. <laughs> well, the rules, what they had, what they told us to do, and everything. Yeah, you shut up. Yeah, if you don't, you know, you get a beating or, or whatever. You, mm -hmm. yeah. those, uh, showing those pictures, you know, that speaks, you know, speaks volumes about you know, what it was like up there and everything. Yeah. You had to go through. Maybe we can probably cut back on the letter, maybe or something. Maybe cut that one. He's got some par powerful. Parts in there. Are you happy with what's in there so far, Glenn? Oh, yeah. Okay. I have no qualms about it. Website eugenicsarchive.ca. Please can everyone see me and not just a disembodied voice? Um, the title of my talk, my brief remarks, is uh, Notes on an Entangled and Troubled History, Eugenics, Genetics, and Disability. Degenerate, unfit, defective, feeble-minded, moron, imbecile. These were the labels eugenicists helped to create and used to define certain people as less than human and unworthy. Starting in the 19th century, based on biased typologies of human evolution and development that were further infused by rudimentary theories of heredity and genetic inheritance, a new brand of social reformer, the eugenicist, began to demarcate boundaries between normal and abnormal, desirable and undesirable. Eugenicists exhibited many anxieties about industrialization, urbanization, and immigration, and change more generally in modern society. As at the time, modern cutting edge professionals and thinkers, eugenicists sought to apply scientific solutions to what they perceived to be serious social problems. By applying theories of heredity, often extrapolated from animal and plant breeding, eugenicists sought to contain spatially and prospectively the unfit and encourage and expand the fit. This resulted in a spectrum of eugenic policies, laws, and ideas that moved on the one side from what's often called more positive eugenics, and I'll put those in scare quotes, marriage incentives and better baby contests, to more restrictive efforts such as prenuptial certificates dictating who could marry whom. And finally, uh, to the other side, what's known as negative eugenics, with coercive programs such as eugenic sterilization and state-sponsored euthanasia. In the United States, as in many countries around the globe, eugenics undergirded the passage of marriage laws, eugenic sterilization laws, and immigration restriction, and was one of several far-reaching forms of social control that discriminated against and hurt primarily poor people, young people, people of color, and people with disabilities. 32 U.S. states passed eugenic sterilization laws which um, at least 60,000, with at least 60,000 officially recorded sterilizations performed on vulnerable people from 1907 to the 1970s. In addition, in Canada, Alberta, and British Columbia passed had sterilization programs. 20,000 of the sterilizations in the United States occurred in California, in about 10 institutions, 
at the time divided between feeble-minded homes and insane asylums, and scare quotes again. Many more people judged unfit, including in states without sterilization laws, were segregated from society through institutionalization, often long-term and often in overcrowded facilities, where neglect and unethical medical treatment all too often were the rule and not the exception. Eugenicists were instrumental to the construction of the medical model of disability in which cognitive, physical, or psychiatric difference was something to be diagnosed, managed, controlled, and prevented. A human being, with her or his constellation of life experiences, bodily abilities, and limits, was reduced to a label. In the case of eugenic sterilization in the United States, historical records for many states indicate that very often people, especially young people, under about 25, and as young as seven, who transgress social norms by participating in non-normative sexual behavior or gender appearance, by skipping school, stealing food, or committing petty crimes were targeted. In a forthcoming article that I did with Natalie Lira, who's here facilitating one of the tables, we show that Spanish surname patients in California state institutions were sterilized at elevated rates in the 20 to 25% range in places such as Pacific Colony. Thus, there was racial bias in California most markedly against people of Mexican origin. Everyone who was sterilized, though, whatever their racial, ethnic, or class background, was painted with the brush of disability. In looking back at the 20th century era of state eugenics with the hindsight of today, it can be morally satisfying and very easy to condemn policies such as sterilization or long-term institutionalization and think we're smarter and more enlightened today. And of course, we should recognize that such abuses occurred and they are interwoven into the fabric of 20th century modern history, whether in the US, in Australia, or of course in Germany. Furthermore, sterilization abuse continues in this country and other countries, and many of you are aware of the revelations about 150 women were sterilized in authorized procedures in two California prisons from 2006 to 2010. Sterilizations have also been reported in Peru, Uzbekistan, and a variety of other countries. Yet frustratingly, the recognition of the wrongness of eugenics has not necessarily been understood in scholarship or popular media in terms of the lives, experiences, and futures of people with disabilities. Rather, in many cases, people with disabilities have been the unnamed foil against which eugenic sterilization has been seen as misguided. Let me explain. One of the most well-known stories of eugenics in the United States is the Carrie Buck story. Carrie, her mother and daughter, were institutionalized at the Lynchburg Colony in Virginia and sterilized under that state's law in the 1920s. The case bearing Carrie's surname, Buck versus Bell, tested the constitutionality of that law and was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1927. It served as the basis for Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' and famous declaration, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Holmes upheld the constitutionality of sterilization based on the right of the state over individual rights to protect the public health. Using the analogy of compulsory smallpox vaccination, Holmes argued that the state also had the duty to cut the fallopian tubes, thus protecting public health from bad heredity. In one of his insightful essays on the misguided uses of science, Steve J Stephen Jay Gould was the first to demonstrate that Carrie Buck was not retarded. In fact, Carrie had done well in school and her daughter was normal according to all mental and physical indicators. Her crime was being the victim of an incestuous rape for which she was labeled promiscuous and feeble-minded. Carrie Buck, her mother and daughters, were terribly wronged by Virginia's sterilization law and the zealous eugenicists who upheld it. And this story is an important one. However, the problem with eugenic sterilization was not just that people mislabeled as defective or disabled were victimized, although this certainly occurred, but that people with intellectual disabilities were the foremost targets of coercive eugenic practices. Their stories are forgotten because they left few lit written traces of their lives and often have no children to recount their past. In some instances, there was legal or political action with the class action lawsuit in Alberta, that's um, in Alberta, or the advocacy of mental health and disability groups in Oregon 
about uh, a little less than 10 years ago that successfully demanded an apology for eugenic sterilization. Moreover, often parents of children with disabilities, following the mantra of doctor knows best and the paternalistic compassion of the pro-institutionalization argument, believed they were doing the best they could for their children who wouldn't fit in and perhaps had many special and time-consuming needs. So I contend that we need to put people with disabilities at the center of the history of eugenics, not to turn them into victims, but to recover their experiences and their dignity, and to understand with much greater clarity how eugenics, and specifically eugenic sterilization, help to create and entrench the medical model of disability. I suspect that digging into this history, as the team I'm working with on qualitative, on a qualitative and quantitative analysis of 15,000 sterilization authorizations and authorization forms in California, will reveal this history and also, I suspect, will reveal many hidden acts of resistance. We already know that the National Association for Retarded Children played a key role in the modification of California's eugenic sterilization law in 1953, which led to a decrease, although not an end, to reproductive surgeries in state institutions. Despite great strides in disability rights law and advocacy, the medical model remains intact. It is exceedingly resilient because it fulfills many functions for many different kinds of people. The impulse to attain what is normal and healthy as juxtaposed to what is abnormal, different, defective, or disfigured, even if the boundaries between these definitions are historically contingent, is unwavering and often unquestioned. The medical model was a cornerstone to the development of prenatal testing, which became routinized in the 1980s. The rationale for testing fetuses for intellectual disabilities through amniocentesis or cryonic villus sampling, most notably trisomy 21 associated with Down syndrome, was largely one of disease prevention with corollaries of cost effectiveness and eugenic betterment. Thus, for people with dis intellectual disabilities, eugenics started in the 20th century, but it didn't stop in the 1950s after World War II. Sterilizations and institutional segregation, and in some cases medical experimentation, continued. Nor in the 1970s with the prom promising advent of rights movements and bioethics, because it was then that prenatal testing took off, following the laudable track of reproductive autonomy, but not the track of disability rights. Today, the prevention and medical models are integral to the commercial rollout of new non-invasive prenatal tests that generally can be performed in the first trimester. But at the same time, the landscape of genetics, ethics, and social justice has changed since the coercive state practices of the 20th century and from the earlier amnio era of the 1970s and from the 1970s to the 1990s. Disability rights, for example, in terms of access and accommodation and awareness has expanded significantly in the past few decades. Thus, I see cause for both concern but also for hope. Notably, a small, hopefully growing minority of geneticists and genetic counselors have been embracing and promoting, and in some cases demanding, as loudly as they can, a social model of disability. Several genetic counselors have launched programs that emphasize the joys and challenges of the lives of people with disabilities. Um, in these programs, students are matched with families, learn about the psychological and medical models of uh, need, uh, psychological and medical needs of children and adults with particular genetic conditions. Others are creating resources that are disability friendly in terms of messaging and imaging, which is very important, often working in concert with groups such as the National Down Syndrome Society. But these genetic counselors are swimming against a strong tide of commercialized interests who want to sell their products to a huge market, all women of childbearing age. And of course, as a, comp as a component of prenatal health care, standard of care prenatal testing is and should be an option for all women of all backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses who want it. So the rub is how to strongly support reproductive autonomy and disability rights. I hope today we can engage collectively about how to move towards a society in which disability equality is valued, is visible, and is the status quo and reproductive and de genetic decision making occur in this context. Thank you. I'm gonna go a little um, off script. I wanna start by thanking everybody for coming. And I wanna let you know, if uh, many of you do already, that um, 
we had such an amazing response when we started putting out the word about this conference that we reached the capacity of this room five weeks before today. And that was really with kind of minimal publicity. And so I think that, you know, th those of us who are here and many others who aren't able to be here today are um, really eager, really hungry to explore these issues. And they're, you know, they're challenging issues, they're tough issues. But I, I think that there's something, and I don't know what it is about the timing now that really is an opening for these kinds of conversations. Um, so I, I'm really, really excited about being here and that all of you are here. And, and I also wanted just to take a minute to say that the, the organizing committee um, that put this together that was mentioned before is a really spectacular group of people and I, I, it was such an honor to work with them. And, and, and that this effort also has grown out of a couple of other um, pieces of work that most of the people on this organizing committee did and, and also mentioned there's a couple other people in the room, Miros Chavez Garcia and Troy Dustro, I know is going to be here later if he's not here yet, who together organized an event at UC Berkeley Law the summer before last summer exploring the legacy of eugenics in California which is something w that Alex has, um, where did she go, has written about um, in a really important book. Um, and I wanted to let you know also that um, the Center for Genetics and Society, which is where I work, we're, um, we do a series of webinars that we call Talking Biopolitics, and there's one coming up with Alex Stern and Corey Johnson, a reporter with the Center for Investigative Reporting who uh, wrote an expose this summer about the prison um, unauthorized sterilizations in California prison that Alex mentioned. So that's on November 14th, and there's a flyer um, on, in the lobby about that, and I invite you all to participate in that. So let's see, I wanted to start today by um, just a few words about how I came to these issues. And I actually started first working on the social challenges and the ethical challenges associated with human biotechnologies. And I did this because I learned of a campaign by a few influential scientists and bioethicists and others to use these powerful, these powerful new technologies um, to actually literally try to breed better babies. And I was shocked by this and very dismayed and um, started the work that became, that, that along with other people, Richard Hayes, who had hoped be, to be here today, um, s resulted in the Center for Genetics and Society. And I think w the, the reason for me that this new eugenics, this new high-tech eugenics was so shocking was because I grew up in the 1960s um, at a time when American Jews were just starting to grapple with what had happened in the Holocaust. And even in the, our Jewish community, there had been this silence for many years about it. So as a child, I, I, I learned about that. But as an adult, when I started doing this work, I did not know that people with disabilities were the first targets of the Nazis. That was something I learned in the course of this work. I, I knew a little bit about the US um, and British eugenics movements, about eugenics movements in other parts of the world. But if I had, when I started this work some 15 years ago, if I had you know, seen Glenn's video and heard Glenn's story and heard Alex's remarks at that time, I would have been shocked. I would have learned, you know, I, you know, I'm learning still, and I would have been at that time really shocked. And just a few years before I started this work, I had, um, I had a baby. And um, because I was older than 35, I was kind of, you know, put on the assembly line to have an amniocentesis, and my doctor told me to do it, so I did it. I didn't ask any questions. I didn't think it through. So, you know, I, I, in these last 15 years, I've really learned a lot, and I've learned a lot, including from people that we're going to be hearing from today and other people in this room, and, um, and I'm just, you know, I, I am... Um, you know, kind of amazed really, but also really grateful that there's so many people, all of you, who are more thoughtful about disability, eugenics, and brave new worlds than I was well into my adult life. 
So, okay, so Alex ended her remarks talking about these new prenatal genetic tests, and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, let's see, I want to <laughs> speed up a little bit. I, I, I want to start by pointing out that, you know, when, when amniocentesis um, was introduced, Alex and I were talking about this yesterday, um, th the, this was before the disability rights movement as we know it today really existed. The disability rights movement, the D Americans with Disability Act 1990, amnio was introduced in the 70s and the 80s. But by the 90s, mid, late 90s, early 2000s, there really was a very robust critique from a disability rights point of view of prenatal genetic testing. And um, Adrian Ash is a name often associated with it, and Marsha Saxton, who's here with us today, she wrote an article in the 2005 edition of Our Bodies, Ourselves, and she noted um, something that really struck me as quite interesting, which is that people around the world, people with disabilities around the world, had a very similar response to prenatal genetic testing, and the response was along the lines of, these prenatal technologies send the message that your birth was a mistake, your family and the world would be better off without you alive. So, you know, that's something pretty hard to grapple with. Now, here we are in 2013, and we're on the cusp of a, re a technological revolution <coughs> that is going to have the potential of greatly, greatly expanding prenatal genetic testing. And what this new technology does is it takes a ordinary blood draw from a pregnant woman, and from that blood can um, isolate and analyze fetal DNA and this is at nine or ten weeks of pregnancy. So, you know, before you've told a lot of people, maybe before you've told your mother or your best friend, that you're going to be able to find out all this information about your fetus. Now, right now, the companies that are, the tests for the prenatal genetic tests of this type that are on the market, um, uh, they're being marketed by four companies in the United States, and they're often called non-invasive prenatal tests, and I'm going to use NIPTs, which is often you'll see in the literature. Um, it's, it's being taken up faster than any other prenatal technology has ever been taken up. And unlike amnio, which is invasive and which does present some risk of causing a miscarriage, there's it's not risky at all. It's not invasive. It's a blood draw. It's cheap. So amniocentesis, about uh, 100,000 women or so a year undergo it. And people are saying that these new tests, these NIPTs, it might, be, it might go up, you know, 30-fold. It might go up to 2 million, 3 million women who, um, who take one of these tests. So, you know, the first thing is that this is pretty likely to reduce the number of people with Down syndrome in the world. And it certainly does have the potential to reinforce the assumption that Down syndrome is a dread disease to be prevented. And I think these tests also have the potential of really dramatically transforming for all women what it means to be pregnant. What is their experience of early pregnancy? So it's really something to contend with. And there, there has been pushback. There, at this point, um, it, there, there are a number of um, very prestigious medical organizations that have issued statements saying we should be cautious, we should go slow, this should not be a routine part of prenatal care. And that's something different from the previous experience of prenatal genetic testing. But there's a problem, and the problem is that they're meeting this incredible commercial force and, um, you know, there's a lot of money to be made here. These have to be, you know, in, in, one way to evaluate these non-invasive prenatal tests is that they are products, and they're a kind of a product that is a, a, a very coveted kind of product. It's a product that has an entirely new consumer base that didn't exist before. So that's, that's the commercial <laughs> force that's against us. And then the way these tests are being marketed is something that we really need to look at. And um, I just want to share real quickly um, a little bit of what um, the wonderful writer George Estreich, who's also here today, um, has, has written about these tests. He, he, he wrote a series of articles for the Center for Genetics and Society blog, blog Biopolitical Times, I'm happy to say. 
And he really writes about how these companies have in, um, unbelievably managed to harness the rhetoric of health, choice, and information in order to sell these tests. So I, I really recommend those to you. Okay, these tests right now count chromosomes. So they give a certain number of results about different syndromes. <coughs> On the horizon are genetic tests that do more than count chromosomes. In fact, um, there have been papers showing that in scientific literature showing that we're pretty soon going to have available tests that can give you a complete genetic readout of your fetus at nine or ten weeks pregnancy. And the results that come back are going to be like the results you'd get right now if you took a little of your spit and sent it with a few hundred dollars to one of these direct-to-consumer gene testing companies. They'll tell you risk probabilities for dozens or hundreds of conditions and traits. And what the heck are people going to do with that information? And what does it mean about how we think about our children and how we think about what it means to be human? And are we going to start using those not just even healthy, to get healthy babies, whatever we, any of us, any of us might mean by that, but better babies. And those <coughs> questions about, you know, the baby that's not just healthy but prettier, more musical, more athletic, smarter, those questions about human enhancement are also now, you know, staring us in the face. And we're going to be have the great good fortune of having an extended look at those questions in the, the film that's going to be screened tonight, documentary called Fixed, The Science Fiction of Human Enhancement. Oh, that's my timer saying I'm up. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to take 30 more seconds. I, I think, you know, the disability rights movement has, has, is really takes credit, should take credit for putting on the social agenda the question of how we collectively understand what does it mean to be healthy? who counts as normal. And even though not everyone <coughs> in the world has felt, you know, moved to really grapple with that challenge to date, I think we're in a, at a moment right now where those questions about, those questions and questions about eugenics are really going to be unavoidable. So I think we should take it as an opportunity to really think about how we want to, how we, the greater we in this room, want to facilitate those conversations in a way that takes account all the tangled things that we're, that we're going to be grappling with today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have a terrible cold, so I'm going to try to A, keep my distance, and uh, B, not cough all over you and through this presentation. So b bear with me, if you will indulge me. Um, I'm going to steal a little bit, actually, from, from you in terms of your presentation. Um, I thought it was really powerful when you talked about why, um, how you came to be interested in this type of work or this, these, these topics. I, I think maybe it might be useful to talk a little bit about um, how I came to be in the work that I am in as well. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm the director of an organization in Alberta called uh, Neighborhood Bridges. Um, we're an organization that does uh, a whole bunch of stuff all at once in an effort to make a community where we'd all like to live. Um, Neighborhood Bridges believes very strongly that um, the creation of the, the mythos of disability, that kind of labeling, has created a society that is not fully whole because we don't really embrace the idea that the nature of any birth and any personhood is equally valuable. Um, and I think for, for folks um, in our community, we all have those kind of watershed moments that we talk about. Um, for me, I was 18 years old. Um, I'd recently emigrated to Canada from South Africa. Um, and I grew up in South Africa during the heart of apartheid. Um, a ca you know, and I think that in North America, at the time that we, we, we when we came to, to Canada in North America, there was this really strong feeling that um, a, apartheid was a sort of an, a, an offensive condition with which to live, and um, I, I, I would agree with you. Um, we moved to Canada, um, and uh, the notion of apartheid and the legislation and policy that led to apartheid in Canada um, was built on the reservation system that was set up in Canada, um, which is not actually commonly taught in the same way that eugenics is not commonly understood 
um, at, I won't speak for the US, but certainly in Canada. Um, and at 18 years of age, as a university student, I took a trip um, to the provincial training school. And uh, that was where, um, Glenn, you grew up, right? Um, its name had been changed to something more benevolent at that time. It was called Missioner Center. Um, and um, I remember distinctly walking into one of the villas there. The buildings were called villas. Um, like it was sort of like a holiday establishment or a nice resort. And um, the villas were all set up the same way. And um, when Glenn talks about the quiet rooms, what would happen is if you were bad, you would go to the quiet room in one of the other villas. And you would go, somebody like Glenn or um, Lilani Muir, who some of you may have heard of because she um, spearheaded one of the first lawsuits against the provincial government in Alberta. Um, if you were bad, do you see the scare quotes? Mm -hmm. If you were bad, you went to a quiet room and you were put to work on the units. And um, we walked into one of the villas, and uh, Ash Villa, and um, there was a naked woman on the floor in the middle of the common area. Um, there was a group of staff, they used to wear lab coats in 1988, um, standing in the corner. And the, the common area was set up, uh, sort of a room much like this, but with concrete floors, because they're easier to clean, was what the staff told us. And um, there was a ring of chairs around the perimeter of the room where people were rocking back and forth, um, yelling, screaming. Um, there was one corner where people were dancing to um, a ghetto blaster, but this, this young woman was on the floor and she was um, naked. Um, she was by a wheelchair. And as we came walking in, I guess they hadn't been anticipating the tour because at that time it was also considered quite common that you could tour through what were identified as people's homes. Um, and um, one of the staff grabbed a sheet and came over and covered this woman with the sheet. And then um, the woman started, to she had cerebral palsy, she was very agitated, and um, he, uh, he covered her face as well, and, and by my viewing, you know, she looked more agitated um, and more distressed, and it struck me that that floor was probably pretty darn cold, actually. Um, and when I asked this, the, this, this guy who was in charge, and here I was, like this young university student, um, and I'd come from South Africa to Canada because it was like way more progressive, and our family was politically active in South Africa, and we had like 24-hour police surveillance, so we were gonna go somewhere safer. And so I just sort of collected myself to the idea that like maybe Canada wasn't entirely without sin. And there I was looking at this woman on the floor and I said to this guy in the lab coat, so it clearly indicated like who was in charge and it wasn't me or the lady on the floor. Um, you know, like I think she's like not liking that. And um, his, his response was, well, she shimmers her way out of the chair and this is her consequence. So, um, so, so when people say, well, why do you do this? And I'm like, because I'm really mad, like, all the time. And it was this or a life of crime. So we went with activism more so. So um, when, when I started Neighborhood Bridges, um, the notion was that we wanted to look to um, philosophers like Jürgen Habermas, the folks who sort of talked about democracy in a way that meant that when we talk about democracy, what we're really saying is everybody has resource, opportunity, and knowledge with which to participate. And um, so our involvement in the Living Archives project, um, for me, uh, resonates at a very personal level. And um, one of my key roles in the project is to take survivor testimony. And for me, that's also really important because I don't know how to tell the story, I think, the people who've survived. And we, in the project, define survivors and more broadly than just people who've been sterilized. We think new forms of eugenics are much more pernicious in some ways. Um, but to, to bring you back to sort of um, why we thought it's important to um, tell the stories, and you'll note it when, um, when Glenn was telling his story through the credits, what we've done is to try to build community around the process of, of taking survivor testimony. So survivors and interview participants watch, watch the first edits and help us edit the films and choose music for the films and, and build the films with us, and the film's not done until the person in the video says it's done. And um, we've reconnected a lot of people who, have, who would have otherwise lost contact or never met through the process of making these films um, so that they can have that shared experience. Um, one of the hard things about social movements is often there's sort of watershed moments um, for the disability rights movement and for the sort of like survival of eugenics movement, if we want to call it that. That moment is really hard to find. Um, there's, not, there's not, you know, um, that sort of like 
uh, there's not a bus strike or the, the, the shooting of um, Martin Luther King, like those moments that really galvanize people into action. Because more broadly, I think in our world, we still don't see disability as being discrete in culture and distinct. And that sort of shared experience of both, you know, success, but also significantly oppression, right? Which leads us to the idea that eugenics and the Sexual Sterilization Act in uh, Alberta was a, was a normative thing. Um, the Sexual Sterilization Act in Alberta was in place from 1928 till 1972. It's one of, or if not, um, the longest standing piece of legislation relative to sexual sterilization. Um, it was very heavily entrenched. Um, the premier of our province housed his son at the provincial training school. Um, the suffragette movement, particularly um, Emily Murphy, who was a very famous um, female politician and women's right, rights advocate in Alberta, um, strongly was a, was a strong proponent of the idea of, of eugenic sterilization. Um, and I think that um, it really, um, the, the legacy of that, that the eugenics movement follows us today. Um, in 2009, we did some press relative to this project. And as part of the interview, um, a number of us talked about new forms of eugenics where people with intellectual disabilities can be prohibited from being married. Because eugenics isn't just about not who can have babies, but it's about who has the right to love. Mm -hmm. and, and how love, particularly if you have certain types of disabilities, can become like my work and therefore my, my decision around who you can love and if you can marry and if you can have children. Um, the, the internet comments around some of this media work that we did were d deeply, for me, disturbing. Um, they strongly indicated the idea of uh, sexual sterilization for people with disabilities might be indeed still a very wise decision to make, that if people have disabilities and can't take care of themselves, they clearly can't parent. Um, in our community at Neighborhood Bridges, we support parents to raise their children, I would contend that that would be a very flawed argument, um, based on the science even, but uh, and based on our experience. I guess um, what we struggle with often is this notion that disability is a very heterogeneous group of folks, um, but our systems want to apply with very homogeneous responses. So, um, for example, of the and the numbers of sort of who was sterilized under the Sterilization Act is a, a bit contentious. Um, but um, at a minimum, 2,800 people were sterilized under the Act. Um, of those 2,800 people, only 24 people were ever turned down for sterilization. Um, the average time in front of the board, as Glenn talks about, is five minutes. Um, and of those 24 people who were initially, the board said, no, no, we don't think they need to be sterilized. Um, the staff at the institution, all brought, they, they were brought back, and actually those 24 people were all ultimately sterilized anyway. So what does that mean in terms of uh, where we are today? What is the experience now? Um, the experience now is if you're a mom or a dad and you're labeled intellectually disabled, um, in Canada your kid's probably getting taken away. Um, and it doesn't matter if you can parent. Parent after you learn some stuff with a little bit of help or a lot of help. And increasingly the research is showing us that often, in fact, through the child welfare system and the justice system, these kids are getting taken away from parents labeled as having disabilities. Um, but the, the defining decision um, is typically around issues of poverty, where parents who weren't labeled as having intellectual disabilities would keep their children. So um, in our experience, I'm going to try to say a lot of things in two minutes now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, pre-birth selection um, in Canada is, is another big issue, and what we're seeing increasingly is um, through the work of some activist communities, there's this belief that we can use value-neutral language to talk to parents about their choices. And so you get judged if you're a parent with a disability, and I believe that there's a significant cultural implication around eugenic thinking for parents who choose to have children with disabilities. because. Um, when uh, they started to talk in Alberta and Canada about value-neutral language around genetics testing, um, and this is disability groups have really promoted this idea of value-neutral language. I guess for me, the first thought I had was, this reminds me a lot of what the Nazis talked about when they talked about pure science. Like there's no ethics to science, therefore there's value-neutral. You can choose to do this or you could choose to do this without any sort of respect for the cultural implication and the damage that people like me, as a, as a psychologist, and a social worker, the damage people like me have done. There are tremendous people out in the community who do good work, but institutionally, I think the eugenics frames are still very much alive, 
um, in Canada where we live. But um, I'm the glass half empty person in our crew and Rob when he talks later is much more pleasant. Um, <laughs> however, um, <coughs> I do think that there's a unique opportunity for us here to challenge the notion that those traditional sort of medical models of defining and those moral models of defining like who is worthy but also who's smart enough. The IQ test is like the bane of my existence. Um, IQ doesn't mean what you are, it means where you're at. And th that's just the science of it. And IQ doesn't mean the same things as what I can do. And I think those kinds of challenges can actually create futures that are, um, you know, eugenics free, if you will. And so our involvement in survivor testimony is really guided by that. And um, we believe that we can, in fact, make a world where everyone's a valued citizen. And so our work will continue in that area. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce one of my co-conspirators, Milton Reynolds, who is our facilitation guru, and he will be um, kind of l mapping out the day in terms of a lot of the interactive exercises we're going to be doing and setting the stage for that and also telling us what we're going to be doing next right now, too. So this is Milton Reynolds from Facing History, Facing Ourselves. All right, so, so welcome, everybody. It's so great to see a full room, and, and we're going to get ready to try to make meaning of the panel. So over the course of the day, we're going to be asked to engage after every panel. And in each situation, we're going to use a different sort of teaching practice. And we're going to use them as a way of creating equity of voice and really trying to build a conversation. So many of the strategies will preference listening first and then moving into a larger, more organic conversation. So the first strategy we're going to use uh, is going to be titled, Learn to Listen, Listen to Learn. There are some, I believe they're taupe colored papers that uh, are aligned with this strategy. And each of the other strategies will be on a different <coughs> colored paper. So they will be in the center of your table. And each table also has a facilitator. So facilitators, if you could just raise your hand so people uh, know who you are at your tables, great. So they will assist you uh, in the first conversation. But again, the basic idea of learn to listen, listen to learn is that everybody's going to respond to the same prompt. And so as a table group, what you'll do is you'll go around and each person will be able to just share a few thoughts. It's not really an opportunity to deliver a dissertation, but really to seed a conversation. And so after everybody's had an opportunity to go around and share a few thoughts, what you'll then do is just take a moment of reflection and then move sort of more organically into a conversation. But a conversation in this case, it'll be based on the collective uh, uh, assessment or takes or big ideas from uh, the first panel. And so the prompt that I would love for you to respond to is what was either new or significant to you in the panel, right? So what was either new or significant? And what questions does it raise for you, right? So what was new or significant and what questions does it raise? You might take just a moment or two just to reflect and gather some thoughts in writing and then your facilitator will then lead you into a conversation again with everybody sharing their voice first and then moving the conversation after everybody's through. Yeah, so uh, the prompts are what is either new or significant that's presented by the panel. So what's new or significant, and then what questions were raised for you. Uh, and if you pulled someplace else, that's okay too, but that should give us a starting frame. So thanks. What are some of the, the nuggets or big ideas that came up from uh, your table discussions or questions you'd love the panel to respond to? So. Maybe if you raise your hand, we'll sort of call on folks and try to, to get some for the next few moments. We'll go one and then two. Yes, please. What, what, is, what, is, what does community have to do with these issues? Um, what are the, and I like um, the notion of bridges to community. I think that's really, oh. Community and, and bridges to community. We also talked about uh, spaces where uh, people could gather to find common interest and then you know seek seek common solutions um, and also the necessity of sometimes bringing people in from the outside of both the social and medical in order to facilitate these discussions
So I serve on the board of directors for a Down syndrome organization. And in being involved with this organization, I've learned that roughly 80% of all parents, they get testing to see if their child has the, I forget the name of the gene, but see if their child has Down syndrome. The majority of the time, the doctors do not even give these families options to have the baby. They just do a presumptive close and tell them that they can schedule an abortion on such and such a date. And I've got tons of real life stories that I've heard from families about this. And I was just wondering, well, I wanted to get your response on how you feel about eugenics not being as prevalent, but it's kind of moved over to, into the abortion realm to whereas they're not sterilizing individuals with disabilities, they're just killing the babies before they're born. And um, yeah, and I think these tests have moved into a, to a state to where they're, no, they're not used really to inform parents that they might have a child with a disability and to provide them with resources or information on how to provide that child with a successful life and to find happiness, but they're more used as a marketing product to sell abortion. Because when, with all these families that we talk to, they don't say, hey, look, you're gonna have a child with Down syndrome. This is what it means to you. This is what you can expect. This is how you can raise them. And these are the resources available to you. But it's either kill or you know, give birth. So I would like to get your thoughts on that. Um, so we at Table Ten we talked about um, kind of the hierarchies of disability, um, and you know where is the cutoff? Like what is what can we define as severe, and what can we define as healthy? Um, I think like as a society we're at a point where we can um, talk about like different standards of beauty and all that, but for health it's a lot more difficult to argue. Um, we also talked about you know the decision to have a child with disability is also a decision to bankrupt your family. Um, and like how we need to improve our universal care in order to um, have continue that discussion. Um, we talked about the tension between disability and reproductive rights, um, and how you know it's difficult to um, to parse that out, to like untangle that, um, and see if you know we we can't refuse that information to <laughs> parents, um, but well, we feel conflicted about refusing that information. Um, but we also have to think about reframing that and using prenatal tests not to abort, but to better prepare for you know a better um, childhood. Um, and yeah, I think we were talking about how disability alone should not be an indicator of the quality of your ability to parent as well. Just a quick concrete question for Nic Nicola, mm -hmm. is it? Um, if we could hear more of concrete examples about, of the work of Neighborhood Bridges. We had similar questions around the prenatal um, testing, but we also wanted to know a little bit more from Glenn about um, how people were um, assigned to the institutions what, what that process looked like and I'm sorry. We were talking a lot about connections and the, the larger dynamics of these smaller questions. So one would one came up around, you know, if you were if you were sterilized, um, would you later be disqualified disqualified from um, adopting? And we had some anecdotal information that there are different private agency and state laws and and a story where that did happen. Um, but then we were also looking at just these branching outs of what are all the different effects, not just, um, so that's sort of a larger effect of the immediate sterilization, but then also the same kind of idea of what are all the different effects of our, our searching for norms and um, power structures and our creating norms and power structures that then um, 
don't include so many people and how do you move from a medical model to a social model and have that social model be real? How do we deal with all these different competing, contrasting pressures and tensions that are all part of being human in creating something that is holistic or accepting? I think that that's sort of where we were going. Yeah, and here at table two, a couple of themes came up, a number of them, but one that struck me was hearing some of us talk about just acknowledging our own internal um, need to resolve how we feel about the subject and then seeing in ourselves that we have some things that maybe need, we need to look closer at, you know, in terms of when is it okay to, um, if you're going to, um, have a baby with, say, um, a sperm donor and screening out, you know, the ideal donor um, or things of that nature, um, just making assumptions about what somebody looks like and, and where they're from, what they might turn out to be in terms of their contribution to raising a family. Um, and I don't... I don't know if I can be artic articulate about this, but there was also some discussion about the influence of just the larger corporations on how things are funded um, and what gets focused on with that funding, what, how it might influence um, this discussion. Hi. We're all guys here. From Salinas, we talked about how girls have a lot of pressure on them regarding pregnancy. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we go to four, and then oh, is that fourteen? Oh, fourteen. Excuse me. I guess the one was excluded. Um. So we, we talked about a lot of things, um, but Tina had a couple of really uh, good questions, and one was if you have this kind of juggernaut of money and regulation by which new advances get installed before people have a chance to really even know about them. Um, and she was talking specifically about um, the possibility of three, three parent babies as a way to con uh, combat mitochondrial disease. Um, how do you stop that? How do you combat that? And the second question, and I'm, this is my paraphrase, but. Um, is the more on the consumer end, the people who would be interested in, in using and paying for this test, how do you reach them um, with a, a message that preserves their autonomy, but at, at the same time speaks up for caring for maybe a larger tapestry of people, including the disabled? Great, so I think that gives us plenty to work with, and I'm going to hand it back over to the panelists to respond to <laughs> So would one of any of you three like to respond first? Um, Glenn, would you like to? Uh, they were asking about um, what the process was like of institutionalization and decision making in the institution around sterilization. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Well, uh, where I went from is from the, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, gee, I know how that works. Is that on? Yes. <laughs> Where I come from in an institution, in the environment, I was more or less treated like, almost like an animal. I had to do exactly what the staff told me. And I was, of course, sterilized, of course. And all these things that were involved in an institution, environment, I had to do exactly as I was told. And with strict restrictions. Of course, we, were, we had a bit of freedom, but not as much as we should. So in this case, I see that now, since the new issues have come out on eugenics, gives a more open view of what we can expect as people to see what 
we can be more involved in as a whole. So this would help me see in the future to be more involved in eugenics and understanding the purposes of why we are here. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Would it, either of you like to, uh, Nicola, do you want to speak to some of the questions around bridges and the work sure. you do? Yeah, I can do that. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we do, um, uh, we're, a big, we're a big hot mess at Neighborhood Bridges. <laughs> we like to kind of do everything. Um, so um, there are 17 members of our community who are identified um, through the sort of provincial funding system as uh, having intellectual disabilities and um, being eligible to have supports. Um, the types of people that came to our community, um, some of them were quite purposeful and some of them um, just kind of happened by default. Um, when we um, began the work that became Neighborhood Bridges, our focus was on um, building healthy communities, which included supporting parenting. Um, so we work for um, a number of people who are parents who have intellectual disabilities who are um, either actively parenting or involved in their children's lives, um, which means that we do things like um, spend a lot of time in Court of Queen's Bench and our provincial court system trying to uh, imbue the justice system with the notion that parents can parent. Um, but we also do, uh, by, by default, um, Neighborhood Bridges is a community where often the folks that no one else will have ends up. Um, so the bulk of the people who are a part of our community are people where other traditional social service providers have rejected them, um, where they've spent long, long time, uh, periods of time either in the criminal justice system or in mental health institutions. Um, there are people who have um, what in the traditional vernacular would be called dual diagnosis. They have severe trauma histories and they have not survived well in traditional group settings. And the, so I mean, we're t we've talked today about this idea of sort of institutionalization and people being sterilized. And we talked about, Glenn, you grew up at the provincial training school, but um, we have a hard time differentiating between a traditional group home and, and uh, the PTS. Actually, I can't tell the difference, to be honest. Um, so we don't run any. Swimming people close to rock bottom. Yeah, so Glenn, your point was these are um, folks close to or at rock bottom. Mm. Um, so. One of the things that uh, came up at our table discussion um, that what we didn't sort of get into too deeply was the idea that in the school system, what we do is we, we silo everybody out, right? Like if you're queer or, or, you know, that's where you are. And if you're of race, you're here. And if you have a disability, you're over here. And then we send kids out into the world to try to like make it a better place. And they can't, um, I think you put it quite eloquently, like people don't see the intersections. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens in a more sort of micro kind of way is if you're labeled intellectually disabled mm -hmm. in our community, um, then any other presenting medical issue or psychiatric issue you might have is automatically deferred to the fact that like yeah. you're, you can't be having an acute mental health issue because you were terribly abused. <laughs> it must be because you have behavior problems because you have a disability. Mm -hmm. So our community has become a safe place to um, live and build a life. Um, and the sorts of things that we do, you ask for concrete examples, um, we support people to find their first home, um, to figure out um, how, they, how, how we can be useful to them in that home so that they can, they can figure out what their life might be like once people get out of the way. Um, we support people to go, because um, the, all the people in our community, of the 17 people who've uh, wanted to join our community, none of them have had inclusive educations in any way, so we'll support them to go back and go to college. Mm -hmm fully inclusive post-secondary education, to find work, um, to get better from all the bad stuff that came before, um, to um, figure out who you are and how you want to be that person because uh, you didn't have that opportunity before. And um, because we're built on the idea that uh, healthiest communities is where that happened, we do a lot of community development work and we, do, we like to be participating in research like the, the Living Archives Project because um, uh, while we're all with our feet on the ground rolling around in the muck, we figure our head should stay in the clouds so we can stay on vision. <laughs> so um, I hope that was helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hog too much time. Would you like to delve into some oh of the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess what's going through my mind is what, 
what is it that holds all these these threads that we've put out here together? You know, is there a big picture here that we can, um, in which we can understand all the many different aspects of insensitivity and oppression and inequality that you know that that have come up? And I guess you know I do look at it through the lens of the forces that I think are coming toward us propelled by a lot of um, economic power behind them to to put into place these kind of new ways of sorting people, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes people, you know, who we say, okay, th those, those babies are not going to be with us, but past that as well in terms of um, are we going to be sorting people in terms of their perceived genetic um, capacities or traits? And, you know, we, th th this term eugenics, we don't want to overuse it. We don't want to take away from the very specific things that it has referred to historically and the damage that it's been done historically. But I also do think that, we, that the, the lens of eugenics really does tell us something very important about um, about a lot of the specifics that we're talking about here, about people with disabilities not being allowed to parent, about prenatal tests, about human enhancement technologies that are coming down the line. So it's really a challenge then, you know, to, to, to hold that all in one picture. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess um, one of the things I looked at in my work is, you know, that looking at California and, and the West and the West as a kind of a frontier for um, the expansion of eugenics and making, you know, the ideas of eugenesis a kind of new utopia um, through biological selection. And to remind ourselves that many of the folks involved in that were, you know, at in the time, you know, very progressive. They were actually members of the Progressive Party. So John R. Haynes down in Los Angeles, you know, who commissioned the first, you know, in-depth kind of study of sterilization in California state institutions, won local seats on the Progressive Party ticket and pushed for things like, you know, which are probably, you know, good things like sewage systems and water regulation and things that created an infrastructure that, you know, made most people healthier and have access to to basic services. So at the same time, it was part of his utopian vision. So I guess that that's why I always go back to, you know, this idea that, you know, today's science is tomorrow's pseudoscience. And, um, you know, beware, you know, beware or at least interrogate kind of the progressive, what we think are the progressive dimensions of the uses of certain types of science. Um, Another point, though, is that I really think we need a reproductive justice lens in which to keep reproductive autonomy and choice, if you want to call it that, and also disability rights in conversation with each other. It's very important not to let those two things splinter into, um, you know, competing options. And so that's what I really feel like this, the commercialization, you know, commercialized eugenics, if we'll call it that, pushes us to articulate a new position around that. I don't know what that position is, that's what I'm trying to figure out. But it's a position that um, would, uh, you know, at the forefront of that would be the rights of those in the most vulnerable positions who have been judged unfit to parent to keep their children to have those rights of reproductive justice. But those are rights for everyone as well. So, you know, those are, there's no easy answer and there's no, you know, it, it, it is a kaleidoscopic type of roadmap that we need. And so that's, that's kind of my approach. And it's very important to be introspective about this and to always go back to human experiences and, and, and difficulties and struggles to, for me, to reorient how I'm going to approach this intellectually. So that's kind of how I would respond to some of the signposts or the kind of um, intellectual and also, you know, um, enga community engagement or activist tools that I use to, to navigate some of these difficult issues. I don't know if you guys want to respond to any of what we've said or respond to more of what other <laughs> folks raised. I guess we That's have about <laughs> two more minutes. Who wants to get the last word? 
Dublin, yeah. The issues that uh, have been spoken of, is my mic on? Yeah, I think you're good. Yeah. The issues that have been spoken on are very complex. It's mm -hmm. more of an issue of who stands where and where we stand on the issue of eugenics mm -hmm. as a whole. So we look at ourselves and kind of like in a mirror, seeing ourselves as an image, as we were created from the Creator up in heaven, God, of who we are and why we are here. So that's the purpose I look forward to, and, mm. and this is why we are here. Mm.